Hi, and uh, apparently we are live right now. Um, it's amazing to welcome you all here with this brand new experiment. It's, um, we've been thinking about this for a while, and uh, finally Music Cafe is on the air live. We're on uh, our website with Symmetrica, with Music Cafe, and on Facebook as well. And uh, this um, has been quite an interesting ride for the last two months. And we have this great idea with a couple of friends of mine. And I want to welcome uh, all the way from Berlin, which is in the afternoon there, uh, Johannes uh, Debus and Elisa Lee. So let's see. Oh, and there they are. Hello, hello. I think we are muted. Let me just put you on. Here we are. Good morning. Hello, Alex. Hello. Good, good, afternoon. good afternoon there. How are you? We're doing well. Yeah. yeah. The How kids are is out the... of the house. It's quiet. Sorry? Mm -hmm. The kids are out of the house, so it's quiet for a change. It's quiet in Berlin. Wow. It's been, it's been quite a ride. I think the last time we saw the three of us together was um, in the opening of Hansel and Gretel that, uh, that Johannes conducted here in Toronto. It's been, uh, it's been a while. And what have you been up? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I, I just remember it was a snowy, snowy day in uh, February or end of January. And uh, I hear that um, you still got some snow in May in Toronto. Is that true? Yeah, it snowed last week heavily. It was really, really heavy snow. Um, well, but hopefully it will be it, it's starting to get sunny outside the spring is coming and hopefully they will allow us to go outside after this weekend which yeah, we're still crossed. locked in yeah um so you know, we have a lot to talk last time we spoke something like this but together in a coffee shop we spoke for about two hours about opera and and we're uh, different things but this time i think the situation has changed uh, quite substantially uh, since we spoke that time. Uh, I want to ask you, um, where were you when the lockdown started? Um, so I got back uh, to Berlin after sort of the winter season in Toronto, which I kind of did um, regularly or always, you know, um, go back, see the family, reconnect, etc. Um, and then I should have returned to uh, the other side of the Atlantic, to North America, midst of March. And about a week before my flight, um, it beca became clear that um, the borders would be closed and, and you know, this kind of domino effect of um, events um, started to, to unfold. So. Um, we decided the best we can do in that situation, or I can do in that situation, is to, to stay here in Berlin um, with the family. Right. Um, and I would say it was the right decision. Um, the work that I have to do for Toronto, I can do from home, as everyone in Toronto right now is, is doing the famous home office. Um, so. Yeah, it is what it is. It's not ideal. I, I really, I have to say, I would love to um, go back to Toronto. I miss, I miss Toronto and the people there, and um, obviously the work, not the snow, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, you know, eventually it will happen. So tell me, as I, I know that you can't share a lot of what's going on at the COC, at the Canadian Opera Company, while well, the decision has been made, what's going to happen with uh, the opening of, uh, of the new season. But what goes uh, on through your mind as the music director when you, when you see what's happening? And uh, what, was the first, what's, what are the thoughts? You know, we have this thing where we can't get together. And the productions are big. You know, we we really wanted to do Aida, and and just the sheer number of musicians and performers and stage and is big. So, what goes through your head at this particular point in history? 
Well, I have to say that um, there, there are many, many different things that are going through my, my mind. And um, my wheels are constantly turning. And uh, I guess uh, it's kind of a common thing right now that our emotional states are also going from from one extreme end to, to another. Um, of course, you know, we we have those moments where we are kind of, you know, demoralized because of, of everything that's kind of crashing around us. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, we can see it as a somewhat fascinating moment. And of course, a moment where um, new things can happen. So it can be seen as a great opportunity. So that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, and also to somehow put everything into perspective. I mean, it's an extreme situation for the entire world. Um, as if someone, a higher force, would have pushed the um, stop button on a, I don't know, on, a, on an LP player or a CD player or MP3 player, whatsoever. Boom, everything comes to a, to a halt. Um, and since we are all on this planet affected by, by this, um, it can be seen as a very honest moment as well. And we are all somehow confronted with um, ourselves, who we are, what we are, what we can do. Um, we are confronted with um, the things that are essential, are fundamental, um, and therefore, it, I, I think it's an, it's also a fascinating moment in, in human history. I hate to say it because it comes with so much um, grief. And, right. Um, you know the, the 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 people who are actually dealing with that. Um, disease with the virus, the ones who are working in the front lines, the healthcare workers who are doing, I think, incredible, um, incredible work. Um, and, and we are grateful so far that, that we haven't been in direct contact with, with it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it all kind of puts things into perspective. I'm thinking obviously about um, the artists um, at the CUC. I'm thinking about the orchestra, the wonderful musicians, the chorus, the staff, everyone who um, were guaranteed in the past that we would um, deliver, I would say, an extraordinary experience to, to our audiences. And I also, I have to say that, I also miss our audience um, as we are all, I guess, dealing now with this um, weird situation. We're trying to offer something from our homes or where, wherever we can play and we stream it. But yeah, it's this kind of ghostly atmosphere right. where the audience the receiver, which is such an essential part in this in this setup, in this shared communal experience of a live performance, where that is missing, and I think Alyssa can can give us some first-hand experience because she played. Um, I think it was the very first live streamed, um, let's call it, ghost concert in in the Philharmonie in Berlin. I don't know how that that was. That stage, that okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask um, Elisa two things, but let's start with that. Let, uh, how was it? Like I saw Simon Rattle walking in, and uh, what's the feeling uh, as uh, as one of the musicians there to have a full uh, concert with nobody but you? Yeah, I mean, it was obviously the first time it's ever happened, and uh, everybody. I mean, we were all sort of told to sort of really 
not stand there like zombies and feel uncomfortable. Like we should just really be relaxed and sort of, you know, be as we normally would and try to feel like as if it would be a normal concert situation. But it was somehow still difficult to be like that because everyone did feel very self-conscious. Single, stood there, you didn't smile, <clears throat> kind of a little bit awkward. And then there are moments we started to play where you could forget for a minute that it was empty. And then, but then the most beautiful moments are the pieces. We're having a little Silent. bit of problem with your audio there, but oh, okay. There, there, perfect. Um, okay. So yeah, so in those awkward moments where at the end of the pieces where normally you would expect to have the applause from from audiences, um, we didn't even know if we should stand up. <laughs> Somehow <laughs> it was like, and then um, and you really felt that uh, it's a real the process of playing music is really a, a communication process that and we need that live audience there to really to really be inspired. So that brings me to a question for both of you, um, and I'll ask you about uh, uh, Ensemble Made in Canada shortly, but I, um, I always ask conductors when I talk to them, either when we're having conversations or just casual talk, is who are you working for? Who, uh, Not only conductors, musicians as well. Are you conducting or playing for yourself, or uh, you're trying to please yourself, the musicians, uh, or the audience, but I think it's clear that you're actually playing for for us, for your audience, no? I find that a really interesting question. I think I've had debates with various artists about this. Um, I think, of course, our, 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 our art would not exist without the audience because they give us that pressure of, of trying to reach our maximum and, and they inspire us. That's, that's that that little extra edge is what we need to create for our best. However, um, I would argue that artistically, that the phenomenon for them I make the book that for myself. And so I'm within the creative world and based on these true to your own position. You're not concerned about whether they will like it or enjoy it. Truly decide to do is effective and has it renders the resonance in, in terms of what you're doing and that it will affect your audiences that way. So, yeah, I would agree. That, that, that puts it, um, that's a wonderful sum summary of um, in perspective. What, what we're trying to achieve as um, performing artists. Yeah. So, Essentially, both. You're playing for your, your, you're doing it. You're, you're, you're gauging yourself artistically within yourself, but you need the audience to really push yourself and elevate yourself to another level. I mean, I, I wonder what um, someone like Glenn Gould would say to yeah. that. You know, deciding at some point, okay, I, I don't want to play any concerts uh, anymore. I go to a studio, an empty studio. No audience. Mm -hmm. I just have this conversation between the composer, the piece the composer wrote, and myself. Um, for me personally, that would not be enough. <clears throat> it's it's possible, but personally, I think one key element uh, would be missing. And right. yet. Um, as Alyssa pointed out, um, it's not that that you you don't perform to consciously please your audience. Um, I, th I think you make an offer. Um, it's kind of an invitation to take um, your audience with you on um, on a journey. And um, I remember you were um, often using that term, saying <clears throat> that we have to pull in the audience into our performance mm -hmm. you know it's it's really this this um rather than giving up yeah it's, it's it's maybe more um satisfying gratifying if you have the ability to sort of invite them to join you 
rather than to confront them with something and say, here you have it, um, you know, deal with it. <laughs> and um, and it's actually, it's, it's very interesting. I think it's like a living organism is set up, um, the performers and the audience, and how an audience actually in this live moment can somehow in their shape the performance. Um, the, the might sound a bit esoteric, but the flow of energy um, can have an impact. Yeah. yeah. Concentration in a, in a hall. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it will take, it, it's going to take some time uh, to, to come back, I, I suppose. I mean, I, my company has been trying to figure out what we do next, right? It's like with the opera ballet, any kind of performance. It, it seems that we're going to have to, uh, we've been talking about, you know, changing classical music, changing the art for centuries. And maybe this is the opportunity to change it a bit. I, I'm, we still need the huge, uh, you know, environment. We love going to concerts. We love going to movies. And that will eventually come back. But in, in, in the meantime, in the next few months, I'm sure we're going to have to adapt um, the art or come up with something to, to, um, to engage us, the audience. And I'm not talking about it, digital engagement. I'm talking about, you know, we need to get out of, of home and, and start living again because that's what, uh, what you do for us gives us. You actually give us, you know, what life is for. Um, I wanted to ask you, Alicia, I was thinking this morning, you know, um, that we did the concert in uh, St. Catharines uh, when the pandemic had started already, but it hadn't arrived in, in North America. It was uh, January 24th. Uh, we did this spectacular concert. And um, do you ever stop and think, wow, one month after there wouldn't have been a concert that we prepared for for two years. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we had we, we, we finished basically our the mosaic project just on time, so to speak. And I'm I'm super grateful that we have um, your your video production footage from that concert, which is spectacular and stunning because it's the first time we're on. so wonderful I'm, 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 I'm not hearing you again. Sorry. There must be... Oh, is it because I'm talking there. too softly? Maybe. Yeah. There. Oh, okay. I, I have to yell. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I'm very, very grateful that, that the timing was, uh, was, was, was perfectly just on time. And afterwards, it would have been such a pity to have lost that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you're releasing um, all the recordings on, on Facebook, right? Yeah, we're gonna we're releasing now. We've uh, the the live stream and the, and all the fourteen individual compositions, um, and people can watch how wonderful the production was, how wonderful the concert was, and catch a glimpse of a live concert situation that we we had our a wonderful audience of uh, over seven hundred. In, in the audience, really, it's wonderful. So, um, for those on in, in watching right now who don't know what the Mosaic Project is, we have a, a trailer ready. If you're okay, we're gonna play it back, and then we'll come back sure. to you too. Yeah. Sure. So, if we can please go to the video. We want to find a way of expressing our love for the country, essentially, and celebrating it. I remember they approached me with this ambitious idea of telling a story about Canada through the lens of a whole series of composers, each who would be tackling a different province or territory. is a kaleidoscope of, of Canada um, presented to me by some very, very interesting visions.
the mosaic project would be an audio-visual reflection and representation of our country. It represents the entire country geographically. It's a symbolic number for representing the provinces and territories of Canada. When one listens to all 14 pieces, there is a sense of a massive amount of diversity of musical languages, of styles, of intentions. At the same time, there are some very, very curious continuity aspects that I don't think anyone really expected when going into it. That is the beauty of the project, is that it's not one voice, it's 14 voices that are very contrasting, and yet it creates one beautiful story. This particular instrumentation, I maybe approached it a different way. It's almost like there's a narrative. There's a journey um, going on here. Yeah, it's just a real honor. Um, it stretches my composition muscles uh, far beyond songwriting, even further beyond string arranging, which is still constrained by song. Um, this was, you know, an even more radically open canvas. And uh, we as performers are doing our very best to deliver that, to make that a very memorable experience. Quite, uh, quite spectacular. Yeah, exactly. So, um, tell us, Justin, that, like, obviously we saw what it is, and it's all available now on, on Facebook. How uh, did you con concoct this thing? Oh, uh, I, I can't, gosh, I can't remember, but it was uh, an inspirational moment where we were trying to figure out a way of traveling through the country. We couldn't, couldn't quite figure out how to actually physically do it, so we thought, Put together a music and it just grew into this monster, <laughs> this giant project that kept giving, kept, kept growing and developing. It's been it, 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 actually, literally, physically, we went to so many places and just seeing all that video footage of all those crazy remote places we visited uh it's such a great memory so tell me um uh, johannes you you conduct in europe and 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 here in toronto elisa is uh running all over the country here and obviously a little bit there uh you have uh, kids in berlin who go to school how how does this work with two very talented extraordinary um musicians how how how, how does the dynamic work I, th I think you need someone, uh, at least one person who is good in logistics, and that's Alyssa, of course. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of um, juggling and um, um, calendar work, I would say. Um, but um, ultimately, it's, I think, about the, the things that, that keep us going, the passions we have and share, and um, I mean, in particular, a project that uh, um, also made in Canada brought up the, the mosaic project. Um, it's it's wonderful for me to to see that um, being created from the start somehow and to support it the way I can, um, and um, I think um, that it happens with them mutually and, um, you know I think we respect uh, each other as, as, as artists um, enough to to know when you know, we have to support the other um, and uh, with that idea I think we're able to get this rather crazy life uh, organized and right now we have never been together for 
Yeah. <laughs> Such a long period of time we were. So eight. Yeah, I guess it's, it's the first time you've been together for nine weeks uh, in a while. Longer right? than three weeks. That row, yeah. <laughs> Well, everything is unprecedented in that in in this whole situation. So, um, yeah, our private life as well um, has has changed that way. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, 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 yeah. I guess it's uh, very complicated for everybody. Fortunately, there it's starting to reopen. Berlin is uh, looking to move forward now. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, maybe you could hear a little bit the helicopter um, circling above our neighborhood because um, apparently every Saturday um, there's a, a group of people and um, as far as I know the group is growing um, and they are protesting against those measures. Um, this lockdown and they, they kind of demand even more uh, freedom back mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of an interesting dynamic in this whole process because um, I mean Germany as well as, as other countries in Europe um, is trying to reopen moderately um, but sort of trying to evaluate the risk between um, numbers going up again, a new wave of infection, um, and the risk to uh, somehow suffocate the entire the entire country by um, very severe lockdown measures. Right? So um, in between those two, two elements they are trying to navigate. And so far, I, I think it's so good, and I guess the majority of people is conscious about it and is trying to be um, reasonable. Um, so. I was I was um, reading somewhere or I listened somewhere that the opera and the concert halls all over Europe, actually around the world, during the pandemic in 1918, 1919, the Spanish food, they didn't close. It kept going on. Um, it's very interesting, very contrasting of what happened now that everything is closed. There, there's nothing, and I, I don't think it's ever happened in history that that the whole world shut down like like this. We, I guess, we will all remember that where we were, where we heard, we have to be home. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, clearly, this somehow marks a new era. I mean, some people, you hear some people talking about a new world order. I don't know if it's uh, going to be a new world order, but um, it's, it's, it's one of those pivotal moments in, in history, I guess. Um, but, uh, so many aspects of our life um, have to be reconsidered, recalibrated, um, and be reinvented. Yes, so, the arts are, or especially the performing arts, are one one element of, of that. And um, unfortunately, you know, talking about sort of reopening the countries, um, the things that are thought about uh, first are, let's say, sports. Like in Germany, the, the soccer teams started to play again. They're, there's no one in the, the big stadiums, um, but they will finish the season. And they somehow managed to convince the politicians that this is the right way to go. Um, but the arts are often in this kind of um, this ranking order at the bottom. On the other hand, I feel that um, this kind of impactful crisis, even the politics, the politicians are aware of the, the true value of, of the arts. Of, um, what, it, what the absence of the arts actually means. So they are finally, um, even in Canada, where the thinking, the philosophy is anyway a bit different because it's, um, it's more 
based on philanthropy that you have an opera house or symphony orchestra and so on. But even in Canada, the government decided we have to help that sector. Um, so there's a glimpse of hope, I would say, that the infrastructure, infrastructure in the art sector rebuilt as well. Um, I want to ask you one thing about um, um, the upcoming season and, and, and not to refer, obviously, if they're opening, not opening, what's going to happen, but does a situation like this affect what kind of um, uh, what, um, what kind of performances, what kind of operas you want to play? Maybe the actual work should be different not necessarily if it's happening or not, but does that alter in any way, okay, we shouldn't do this, we should do a different opera? Does that cross your mind at all? Um, no, not really. I think it's more sort of a general um, a general moment of, of brainstorming. And uh, it's interesting, there, you know, every day there are emails coming in from Publishers, for example, um, suge making suggestions, repertoire suggestions, you know, pieces that might be actually doable, given the the restrictions uh, you face at least these days, um, distancing, uh, number of people in in one room, and so on. So, yes, this, this is on everybody's radar in a way but um since everything is is so enormously fluctuous i mean like every every day or every week there's some kind of new studies this there, there are news about this about that um when they they started to talk about how far has one instrumentalist be apart from another they started with um I think it was 12 meters for brass players or something like that. Now it's, they're saying no, um, two or three meters is totally fine. Um, there's no risk. Um, so the, the situation is constantly changing, and um, and therefore we, yeah, you know, we, we are trying to um, constantly adapt to our our take on such things um, and um, I, I, I think it's as, as I, as I tried to, to um, explain before since we have this moment of like time and stand still and nothing's happening and this kind of merry go round um, has stopped we're not uh, traveling permanently, etc. Um, it's a great opportunity to to analyze maybe where are we um, with this art form and what does the future uh, maybe, maybe hold for it or how can we shape the future? Um, yeah. Therefore, therefore, I think um, in in some weird ways, uh, we even we even grateful for having that that hiatus. Right. Um, it lasts too long, to be honest. <laughs> it is. It is very bit, long. I'm getting a little, a little bit impatient. I, I guess yeah. we all are. Um, Elisa, I, I, you're in touch with. Um, the composers that uh, composed for the mosaic project. Um, mm -hmm. Have you talked to them about the, if if the situation triggers anything that they want to compose something different? Is is this an opportunity for composers? I haven't actually had any direct conversation about that. I can imagine that we think it's probably an amazing opportunity. Like we've said, oh, wouldn't it be so great if we could actually compose something? It'd be fantastic. Um, but. I don't know in terms of productivity levels from ourselves. I think our, our brains are like productive to like 
not productive in terms of there's no stress, there's no deadline that needs to come. There's nothing really triggering you to actually get anything done. Um, and I, my brain just comes to the school. So then I can imagine, I don't think I don't think it's quite hard to be inspired by these things. I'm sure you can imagine. I mean, sure you have the time. Um, and I'm also supposed to go to your children. <laughs> we have two kids here. It takes up practically all of the time. I mean, okay, and even if you have to purchase it, it's very difficult to do anything. I'm, I'm losing your audio yourself. again. Sorry, that, but that's the uh, beauty of life. Um, uh, I don't know when it when uh, it comes and goes. I don't know if the, it's the Wi-Fi or something, but maybe, it, it's. Yeah. Um, um, Uh, I wanted to ask a question for both of you because you're obviously the musical power couple in Toronto. Um, <laughs> uh, one plays violin, which is like basically one note at a time. And Johannes, for those of uh, uh, on, in the audience that don't know, you're you're, you're a pianist as well. Uh, so what's easier as a conductor to play to? You become a conductor easier if you're a violinist or a pianist. I, I mean, traditionally, people would say it's it's good if you have some piano skills too. Um, Definitely, I can only hear the melody. I can't. I, mean, I'm just like, <laughs> I just like I hear the melody. Everything else is like something to the floor. You think about like, you don't even need to hear everything. So if you're already as a pianist, you're sort of dividing your brain into like at least four, not six parts at the same time. If you have all those voices and you have to play everything, um, you have a far more bigger head. Yeah, but um, I mean, uh, I didn't know that you um, you know the art of the statement so well. When when you when you play your your melody, your one line, of course you have like the rest of the, the, the score, so to speak, sure. in mind. So, um, you know, I think the, the conducting is kind of a, it's a tricky, um, sometimes weird, sometimes um, absurdly difficult uh, task. And I guess you can, you can master that uh, task and sort of conquer that. Uh, From any from any angle, you can you know you can have an education as a a training as a violinist, a singer, a pianist. I I don't think that there is sort of a a rule that um, says you you have to have uh, no, some good easier. piano skills. It might be easy. It can help. It's like I said. Because I I know conductors who are both. Pianist and violinists. Uh, you know, Mary Nelson is uh, a violinist who had this mm -hmm. conference yesterday online. Uh, of course, you're a pianist. Um, uh, Peter Onjan is also a violinist. So it's um, uh, there. I, I always like to hear a musician's opinion of uh, not who makes better, but what, what is uh, what is easier. I guess for you, it's easier. Um, At least, uh, obviously, plays and does not conduct. But in some level, you also conduct a little bit when, when uh, on the ensemble because I always see you like, let's start. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I guess in some ways, a violinist has that leadership quality um, ingrained in them. Um, but like you say, anybody can can do it. But I don't think I'd be a very good conductor. Let's put it that way. We're going to talk about conducting a. Uh, In the in the future again, when we have um, Johannes, I, I want to invite you again to join us, uh, even if we're outside of quarantine. But I, I want to ask you. Um, I don't have any. It's very hard to read questions from Facebook. I, I don't know if people are asking or not. Um, but I, I I want to ask two things. I heard the rumor out there is that uh, you're making sourdough bread. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, um, it's not quite an original idea these days. Um, it when was we, born of necessity. It, yeah, in a way it was born of uh, necessity. But when we started, um, 
with that idea, so we went to the, the grocery stores and we were looking for yeast and for flour. And um, apparently, there was no yeast. I mean, we went to, I don't know how many grocery stores, nothing. Uh, we were lucky to find uh, some uh, lonely, maybe one, one pack, package of flour somewhere. And that's it. Now it's, I think, the situation um, has, still can't has find yeast. no yeast is gone, but uh, the situation has improved, and yeast um, we can all produce in an easy way. Um, flour and water, basically. Oh, okay. So Alyssa is unveiling the, the, the details. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give them a name. Yes, you live in our, in our, in our yeah, it's a, it's a it's a microorganism. Um, it, yeah, it's a living beast. Um, it has to be fed, and is giving and giving and giving. It's quite it's quite wonderful. And then comes and it keeps, of course the, it sorry? keeps growing and growing. Um, if you feed it properly and maybe and don't use it, maybe you have to play the right music for for the. <laughs> it keeps stuff. growing like a production of Aida. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you know then uh, you, you start to, to, to learn your skills and you start to bake bread or bake bread and, uh, oh Alyssa, Alyssa oh there you go yeah. wow well, huh? it's not very attractive no and has been there has been there so that will be double the size tomorrow well, we used them today, so we we, we, we used that quite a lot. We have we to have, feed them tonight. And then tomorrow we'll probably we'll we'll use we'll leave that much and feed him again. He'll grow again. Then we'll use them up again. So okay. you either have to throw away half, at least half of your starter uh, every day. Otherwise, they just get bigger and bigger, and then you have to feed it more and more. So you have to get the sort of use it or get rid of it, and then feed it, and then you'll have always a certain amount of starter, which is controllable. Um, but uh, it's pretty cool. You'll, you'll have to fun. bring some starter when you come to Toronto. I love yeah. sourdough. And, this is our know. fourth bread. Are you, are you allowed is... to import uh, stuff? Oh, here's the bread, yeah. There you go. Are That's, you allowed uh, to import? I don't, I, I don't know. I just want them to open the border. Forget about importing anything, right? It's like... Yeah. Like, but you, 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 you might you might you might be standing at the baggage claim waiting for your suitcase you know and then the um the officer with the dog is coming by and the dog sniffs the starter and they say hey wait a second <laughs> there you go <laughs> why do you have uh, your your baton and some sour on yeah. your suitcase <laughs> so I, I, I would love I would love to ask you to uh, to play a little bit. You were playing whatever you were playing before we went on the air. It would be fantastic just to. Um, oh my god! Um, oh my god! Da -da 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 -da. It would be amazing just to hear you a little bit because nobody gets to hear you play uh, the piano. And uh, this is um, for all of us joining us. We're we're going to be done very shortly, but this is the beauty of uh, live TV, I guess. Oh my god! That's great. Needs a tuning as I need a haircut, right? But um, <laughs> of course, I, I was I was trying to get a, an appointment here in Berlin, and they say uh, 
the next available appointment is June the 5th. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway. You'll have your Beethoven here uh, for, for the foreseeable future. Have you been practicing yeah. this too? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you know, he's been, he's been I playing mean, this like... Oh. I have, I have a, um, a kind of an obsession with um, child instruments. I, I think they are so wonderful. They are noisy. They are very direct um, and obnoxious. Um, this is uh, one of those. Not that I can, can really play on that, but um, it, it's fun to just just make some some noise with it. Yeah. It it's it's exactly the right time for kids to learn uh, music now. Or actually, for all of us, because you know, although we are working from home, whatever that means. Um, we do have a lot of spare time, so it's time to pick up a hobby. I guess you're making sourdough bread, and maybe I should start picking up piano or the bass or something again. For sure, absolutely. I guess online online lessons. We tried to get our son to learn something. It's not working very well. <laughs> he doesn't want to learn violin or piano from either one of us, so I don't know. Yeah, well... We'll you can't see. force it. No, for sure not. No. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I want to thank you very much. We're going to cut it here today. Um, I, I hope that uh, we will be again in, in contact very soon and, and hopefully close to each other and not uh, this way. Um, and, and we can have other conversations that are more about music, but it was you know the first time that we do the Music Cafe live, and I wanted to have you too especially because you're so close to me and you're such adorable people and i know that uh, everybody likes to see you and hear you I, I, some of the comments that were coming in were that they really wanted to see both of you together because it's uh, quite an occasion that happens not very often <laughs> and and to hear you both and i, I really appreciate everything like uh, really i'm i'm really glad that we got to do this and i appreciate your friendship uh, more than anything it's fantastic oh, to have you both thank you um, so much Alex. thank you and i hope to see you soon i just want to uh, let everybody know including you because uh, you may have to join us on one of these but uh, next week we have two guests uh, first, we have uh, on the clarinet Julian Milkis, who is actually here in Toronto, uh, stuck like everybody is stuck. So we will have him. Uh, I think it will be on Wednesday, but we have to confirm that. And on Saturday, exactly at 11 a.m., we're going to have another friend of mine, and I'm very excited to bring Stefano Poda, who is stuck in Uruguay. And that's going to be a bit of a challenge because I don't know if, how we're going to do this interview, um, um, if we're going to do it in Spanish or uh, a little bit of Italian or if we're going to do it in, uh, in English so everybody can join. We're trying to figure that one out. Stefano is an, an opera director, very, very talented. He's a lighting designer, choreographer. So we have two great guests next week, and after that we have more people coming. But for now, uh, from uh, Toronto and Berlin, and I'm going to bring the graphic up so that they know. Thank you again very, very much. It's been really a pleasure to have you. And uh, hope to see you here very soon. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Stay safe and sane. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.